have been going on for a long, long time. They've been going on for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know who started the Olympics? The Greeks. The Greeks, that's right. And, the, and what did they win? Did they win a gold medal, silver medal, and a bronze? No. They got a crown. They got a crown. A laurel crown. A laurel crown. <laughs> so it, was, it wasn't even made of precious metal. It was made of, it was made of, I guess, this laurel plant. Yeah, laurels and plants are like a leaf, right? And that you've seen them before, you know. Anyway, that's what they that's what they won back in then. I'm glad I've got a heavenly crown, aren't you? And I want to finish my race. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Think about the Colosseum. Think about the big Colosseum and all the thousands of people in Rome that were watching um, the chariot races and other things. The contest was surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Lord Jesus bless your word tonight as it enters into our hearts. Yes. And encourage us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, there's a lot of analogies. Everybody know what an analogy is? I'm sure you do. An analogy is kind of like a parable or, or an illustration uh, that we use and uh, that helps us to better understand um, something else. And, of course, spiritual things, for the most part, are invisible. Spiritual things are invisible, and so, but they're very, very real, like love, faith, trust. You can't see them. You can't put it in a test tube and measure it. All spiritual things really are in a different realm. And so to help us understand them better, the Bible gives us concrete physical analogies so that it makes sense. That's why they had all of the, in the Old Testament, the altar, the brazen altar, and the laver, and all the different pieces of furniture, uh, to, because it illustrated some spiritual truth. That's why Jesus told the parable of the sower. He didn't talk about the ethereal, uh, uh, invisible substance and all that kind of stuff. No, he brought everything down to where we live. He talked about cooking, you know, to interest the women. He said a woman made some bread and, and she put some leaven in three measures of meal and, and the whole loaf was leavened. And everybody, they loved Jesus because he told stories. He talked, talked about the sower sowing the seed. He talked about the fishermen going out and catching fish. And that was a picture of soul winning and all kinds of pictures. And then Calvary, Calvary was where God demonstrated his love for us on an old rugged cross. And then he could have just told us he loved us and just made us feel 
something. But he demonstrated that in a physical way so that we could understand the depth of his love and the cost, the tremendous cost of his love and the pain of his love. And so it was all demonstrated. So here we have a race. And I've never, um, I've never really been a great runner. I know that we have a runner here tonight. Amen. We have a runner. Yes, Sister Shelley, how many marathons have you done? Ten K. So she's done many marathons. Um, so I could interview you tonight, but I'm not going to put you on the spot. I may ask you some questions later on, though, because you know I, I've never been a great at uh, having stamina for running. Um, I think the most I've ever run maybe is a half a mile, or maybe three quarters of a mile, maybe a mile. I don't know. I measured it. And I always thought it was a half a mile, but it might have been more. But I used to try to run in my early younger days. I was a skinny, a skinny, I should say slim. That's a nicer word, isn't it? Like sledge. I was slim like Shannon once upon a time. And uh, so I decided at 16, I wanted, to, I wanted to gain some weight, so I started running. And I, my logic wasn't there. If you want to gain weight, do not run. I couldn't figure out why I wasn't gaining. And I found out later on, if you need to gain weight, you need to eat and work out with weights. And the more weight, the more you're going to bulk up. But running, I don't have a lot of experience in running, but I have lived for the Lord for almost 47 years. So I understand a little bit about stamina and endurance. Uh, so, But I, I will share the little bit I know that my hat's off to you, Shelly, for running. And you ran 10 kilometers? Yes. You ran She ran 10. Does anybody in here like to say, I'll tip my hat to Shelly tonight? <laughs> okay. It takes some stamina. And I'm sure there's, uh, you don't just go out someday and decide I'm going to run 10K. You've got to work up to that, right? So what? how fast did you go the first, or how far did you go the first time? But it takes determination, doesn't it? And you've got to have a goal. Well, I'm thankful tonight that we've got a great goal. It's heaven. Amen. 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 And now, lest you get the wrong idea, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. But that grace has got to work in us. Amen? Amen. It's got to work in us. There's, there's participation on your part and my part. And it's God's grace working through it. I believe that every day I live for God. It's God's grace in demonstration. I couldn't live for God, neither could you. In fact, the devil would kill you if you had a chance. Some people are afraid, oh, the devil's going to kill me. Listen, if he, if he could have killed you, he would have killed you long ago. You know, Don't worry about the devil killing you. You're going to be here as long as God wants you to be here. Right. Amen. And he doesn't have near the power over your life that you, and I sometimes give him credit for. I don't like people glorifying the devil and saying he's so powerful. God is sovereign. Amen. And by His grace, He works in our lives and He gives us the endurance and the stamina to finish this race. Amen. And the Bible speaks about uh, running with patience. All right. Running with patience. It takes patience to run. Amen. It's a, it's a, that's the first attribute that He mentions here that is positive. Now, before that, He mentions a couple of negative attributes. We need to get rid of what two things? Sins and weights. All right, what's the difference? Well, a sin is something that is wrong, and a weight is something that may not necessarily be wrong for all people, but it's probably wrong for you if it weights you down. Amen? Because right, you know, something might be so good for somebody else, it might be really bad for you. Because it hinders your race. It hinders your progress. Amen. So, we see the two negatives. That's out of the way. Sins and weights. 
but the first positive attribute that is mentioned in this passage of scripture is patience. Now, I like this little saying. It says, Lord, give me patience and give it to me yesterday. <laughs> patience. And somebody said, if you pray for patience, don't pray for patience. God will give you tribulation. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. The Bible says that tribulation will give patience. Listen, that's not true. It is true that tribulation will work patience, but you don't get tribulation just because you pray for, for patience. That's not what the scripture says. It says that even if you're going through tribulation, patience will be the result. You're, you're going to benefit, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you what, you can get patience by praying for it. God will help you to be more patient. He will help you to be more understanding. Yeah. Well... Why do we need patience in the race? Anybody have any ideas why? You're looking at me like you're preaching. <laughs> why do we need patience? I would have thought he would have said, the first thing he would have said was, run with endurance. Run with determination. Why does he say patience? Anybody? I'm open. Help me preach tonight. I know I've got the mic. Run with patience. It's a what? Mind thing. It's a mind thing. Would you agree with that, Shelley? It is a mind thing. And patience is the ability not really to give. It's to not giving up. Patience. It, it has a lot to do with with endurance. You know, if you're working with often, I think of patience. I think about a young child <laughs> or a spouse or. Or a teenage child, or <laughs> saints of God. <laughs> you never try my patience, ever. No, 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 no. You're all just so perfect, sprouting wings there. <laughs> if you're dealing with a small child, it takes a lot of patience. A lot of patience. And sometimes, when you're trying to train them, and answer a thousand and one Questions. Anybody got a kid that loves to ask questions? And it can be tiring because it forces you to think. But if you can respond with understanding, realize this is a very, very smart child. And the reason why this child is asking questions is because God has blessed me with a kid that's going to do really well in school. Probably a kid that's going to teach the teacher down the road. But I find that understanding is very, very beneficial to patience. That generally when we lose patience is that we, I don't understand you. I don't know what makes you tick. I don't know why you are the way you are. And we lose patience. I'm counting the attendance. It's coming up all the time. Brother, thanks for coming up. That's 23 now. <laughs> I was thinking, just hoping for the 12 disciples. And now we've gone on to, we're working towards a, a, a bigger, <laughs> a bigger group of disciples. Maybe we'll have 70 before that. I actually preached in a, in, a, in a church one time. And there was just a handful of people. It was my brother-in-law in Ottawa. And uh, I, we had sung. And we were, you know, done the offering, I think, and I was up to preach, and people just kept filtering in. And like, I was right in the middle of my message, and they were coming in like there was probably 10 more. And it threw me off, and apparently I was like, I was preaching right to these people that had just come through the door. Like, it was like exactly for them, and I just like stopped right up, and I'm like, and my brother-in-law says, preach it, brother. <laughs> He's like, stay on track, stay on track. Anyway, so that's maybe going to happen tonight. By the time we're done, we're going to have to we're going to have to do a little more social distancing and spread <laughs> spread out here. Keep on dreaming, Pastor. <laughs> Amen. But having understanding, it is so important. Sometimes when we're praying for patience, maybe we need to pray for under is understanding. But I, I know this one thing: when when you are when you're running a marathon or when you're exercising, you get so many repetitions. And you've got so much distance to cover that sometimes it helps to count, doesn't it? To count. Because it, you, you see where your goal is and you're measuring how far you've come. And let me say this tonight. 
as goal-oriented as we ought to be, heaven is our goal, revival is our goal, spiritual growth, personal growth is our goal, you also cannot be so goal-oriented that you don't see how far you've come. Amen? I've, sometimes people give up, get discouraged, quit, because they don't feel like they're gaining ground. But somebody else looks upon them and says, wow, you are so spiritual. You are growing in God. And sometimes we don't give ourselves credit for the spiritual growth that with God's help we've accomplished. Amen? Amen. I want to encourage you tonight. I hope you didn't come to be discouraged. I don't want anybody, I don't want anybody leaving here tripping over your bottom lip. <laughs> I want you all shining, smiling from ear to ear. Sometimes we don't see our own spiritual development. Amen? We need somebody else to speak into our ear, into our life, and tell us what they see. That's one of the things about discipling. It's not just challenging people and saying, hey, you need to do this and you ought to do that. But it's also saying, I see growth in your life. I've seen Jesus in you, or you were very kind, or you, you were anointed of the Lord. It's important that we do that for one another. Amen? Amen? You'd be surprised how much, when in my younger years, I battled with self-confidence. Uh, but because people, God positioned people in my life that believed in me and encouraged me, and helped me to see the progress that was made in my life. Amen. So have a goal. Set some goals. Amen. And measure. Measure your progress. Amen. I, I remember. I'm, I'm doing this exercise now. I try to do it at least five days a week. And it's called a plank. Would James, would you like to demonstrate a plank? Come on up here. <laughs> demonstrate a plank. Right up on the platform. Okay. We're going to time him. We're going to see how, how long he can go. Okay, you want to try this? This is really good. I used to do sit-ups, and somebody told me they're really bad for your spine. But uh, I wanted to, to strengthen my stomach muscles because they said if you want a good, uh, 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 a, a strong back, you need a good, it's not a good back, you need a strong front. Have you heard that one? You need a good back. Okay, so you're going to get down and demonstrate. Can everybody see him here? Okay. All right, he's got some new pants on. He's just, okay. All right. Now, I need somebody with a... Okay, to time him, just see how long he can go. He should be able to go 90 seconds. Uh, well, we'll just, we're, I'm just going to say that he's done um, 10 seconds. Would you say he's done 10 seconds? Uh, yeah, we'll just say he's done 10. Okay, we'll say he's done 10 seconds. We're going to give him a little bit of credit there. Okay, so. And we're going to just... He's going to start shaking here in just a couple of minutes. Now, this look, it looks easy, doesn't it? But it is, don't start laughing, James, or you're going to collapse. And you don't want to embarrass yourself. Um, you're supposed to try to do um, two, um, all right, he's got about a, a half a minute now. So he's only got to, okay, we're encouraging him, right? Mm -hmm. He's going to go, you know, what's happened is his whole abdomen, his back, everything is just shaking right now because all the core muscles here are being exercised, right, James, would you agree? Yeah, can you feel it? Yeah. Have you been doing this every day? Uh, not as much as I should. Not as much as he should. <laughs> We're going to find out. Yeah. Okay. He's already done about um, 45, well, we'll add 10 seconds, and then 55 seconds. He's almost going to finish. He's pretty good, isn't he? I think he's pretty, he's pretty strong. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he's uh, been carting around some concrete equipment, right? Mm -hmm. Exercising. How many know that really the, the, the premise of exercise is resistance? You're lifting something, gravity's pulling it down, and you're resisting gravity. Okay, still pretty good. I think he's wanting some feedback, some positive reinforcement. Okay, so he's gone actually an hour, an hour, a minute, and he's gone a minute and a half. All right, give him a big head. He did 90 seconds. Okay, so we're ready to fall over now. Okay, so I when I first started out, somebody told me to do, um, to do, um, two 90-second planks. And it looks so easy, doesn't it? But believe me, how many of you have ever tried it? It's really, 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 really good for your back. Um, I started out, and I'm telling you, just to get 45 seconds um, a minute was all 
I could do. I said, oh, Lord, this is so hard. This makes you want to pray. But <laughs> I finally got up to a minute, and then I thought, well, okay, i got to get to 90 seconds. So finally, after doing it day after day after day, you strengthen all of these muscles. You know, that's really good because it helps keep your spine in alignment. It helps keep everything where it ought to be. And, and just helps protect you against injuries as well, right? Helps with your posture. And, you know, I'm getting to be, he's still a young man, but I'm becoming an old man, you know. And uh, I have to take care of the temple of the Lord. And so do you. If we don't, it's going to just start breaking down. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know, you got to use it, use those muscles, or lose them. Well, I got up to 90 seconds, and then finally I got up to two minutes. And now, you know what? I can go a full three minutes with the plank. So I'm not bragging or anything. You don't have to, you know, <laughs> congratulate me or give me a medal or anything. I'm just telling you that by setting some goals and by applying myself, uh, and I also, I set a timer. I set a timer. And I watch it once in a while because it helps me to know, like, when I'm really just shaking, like, my stomach is just going like this because all those muscles are working so hard just to maintain that post, that, uh, that position so you don't collapse on the ground. Um, I watch it, and then sometimes I, I count down the last 30 seconds because I need something just to focus on. Okay, I'm almost there, I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Oh, I did it. <laughs> then I collapse on the floor <laughs> for about two minutes and get my breath back. All right. Well, I, somebody's saying, well, the Bible says that bodily exercise profiteth little. Okay. I will agree, but it's still profits. Amen. And he's not minimizing it. He's just saying that godly exercise, doing things that are godly, spiritual. Like when you first start out developing a prayer life, listen, I don't encourage you to set a goal of a half hour. What I encourage you to do is take 10 minutes after you've read the word and, and, and pray about the word. Take 10 minutes and have a quality 10 minutes with God and share, share everything with, you with worship and then Ask for forgiveness and cleansing, and then proceed with the needs and, and try to pray for yourself, pray for the church, pray for other people. And what's going to happen is, uh, if you will make that an intense 10 minutes, oh, Lord, I love you with all my heart today. Don't think things like, oh, well, if I loved him with all my heart, why did I just fail him yesterday? Don't think like things like that, because you you declare that over your life. The Bible says, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So I declare that over my life. I decree that into my life. Amen. If you said something negative, you know, something to do with, um, let's say, the occult or the witchcraft or something like that, how many believe you'd be impacted by it, whether you were living that evil stuff or not? It would impact you. The words would, right? So a positive, speak positively over yourself and, and, de and decree the will of God over your life. Lord, I love you with all my heart, my soul, my mind, strength. And you pray like that. And have a 10-minute session with the Lord where you love Him and you praise Him and you pray with an intensity for yourself, for your spiritual growth, for the church, for revival, for the lost souls. You, and you do it. And I see, say that God would rather have 10 minutes of quality time with you than you ho-humming for a half hour on your knees. Amen. And what's going to happen? Just like doing the planks, 45 seconds, went up to a minute, went up to 90 seconds, went up to three minutes. What's going to happen is your spiritual appetite and your spiritual stamina, your spiritual power, your anointing will increase and you will progress. He said, well, what about the race? Let's get back to the race. No, that was just an analogy. I want to talk to you about prayer and spiritual disciplines. That's where we're going tonight. This is the race. Now listen, when you are running, you've got resistance of gravity. That's one thing that's working against you. You also have that, that your, your limbs get tired, right? They get depleted of oxygen. That's why you breathe harder when you're running. Why? Because your body is demanding more oxygen. So instinctively, those lungs and diaphragm start pushing down and absorbing more air because your heart is saying, I need more air. So the lungs respond and the diaphragm responds. And you breathe heavier and faster in order to get more air into the blood 
And the blood takes that oxygen and nutrients to the muscles to keep them going. So you've got gravity working against you, resisting you. You've got the tiredness. Amen. And sometimes the lungs kind of get a little bit inflamed, is the word, but they feel like they're almost burning. Have you ever had that sensation when you're running? Because they're working so hard and they're being expanded. And sometimes you have to just stop and and they're almost, the lungs are almost hurting because you have pushed yourself beyond your capacity. So there's resistance. How many know that when we're praying, there is definitely spiritual resistance? There's nothing that the enemy fights any more than you spending time in prayer with the Lord or in his word. But you do it because you know that it's good for you and you set a goal. And you know, spirituality isn't some mystical um, type of a thing out there. Spirituality really boils down, for the most part, to discipline and consistency. Amen? It really takes consistency and discipline to be a spiritual person. And that's why Paul uses these analogies like the race and like the boxers and like the Olympics because all those people that won um, that crown, that laurel wreath on their head, they did that because they had a goal and they wanted to achieve that. It was an honorable thing to achieve that. And they they decided that I can conquer my flesh. See, the flesh would like just to go to Tim Hortons and sit down, drink coffee, and eat 16 donuts. Amen? And one's never enough, right? I, we went to the Vine the other day. And, uh, and anybody ever shop at the Vine? Great little store in St. John. Anybody like the Vine? Great deals there. And I walked by. I, my wife was with me, so I couldn't do what I wanted to do. But there was some <laughs> thrift. Mr. Mrs. Dunster's, Dunster's Donuts or something like that. And I saw those donuts, and they were calling my name. They said, Pastor Gowan, I need to lay it on hands right now. I wanted those donuts so bad. And I looked over at my wife, and I knew if she didn't say something my. 13-year-old son was going to say, Dad, you need to lose some weight. <laughs> They're all after me. They're just persecuting me. My boy says, Dad, we want to keep you around for a while. You trying to kill yourself? So they do things like that. They're very, very mean when you have to live with them. You think they're so sweet here. But I, I had to walk on by those donuts with my nose in the air and say, no. The flesh. You know, you cannot give in to your flesh. If you want to be spiritual, you, the, sometimes the flesh is just downright lazy. I seldom get lazy about reading the Bible because I, I, I begin my day with it. But, but uh, one day I had got to it and like I normally do first thing. And it was just a couple days ago. And I was shocked that your pastor actually felt a, just a little bit of laziness. I felt a little bit of laziness. Oh, yeah, isn't that crazy? And I thought, where's this coming from? You love the Bible. You it's your living. You preach the word of God. You love the word of God. You love to learn and you love to explore and you love to, you love to, you know, see if you can get through the Bible in less than six months. You know, I always add something that's a little, if, if it's got six, um, if it's divisible by six, the book of the Bible, like if Deuteronomy has like 36 chapters and I'll do like six a day. But if it has, like if it's a multiple of seven, then I don't know, I'm just this kind of, crazy guy, then I'll do seven. It's just so it works out evenly. I don't know why I do that, but so I'll set these goals. And so I picked up my Bible and said, wow, I can't believe that my flesh is rebelling against something that I love. But you know, sometimes, hey, don't look at me like you're spreading angels' wings. <laughs> sometimes you're sitting in church there and the pastor says, let's all lift our hands and you should be doing that anyway without somebody asking you about the pastor looks over the congregation and thinks, I'm feeling God, but people don't seem to be entering in. I wonder if they think they're at the exhibition. This is church. And it's not a restaurant. This is church. You come to worship God. So we ask you to worship the Lord. And sometimes you think, well, I will because you asked me. And I don't want to look bad. I don't want to sit here like a bump on the log. So you put your hands up. And then all of a sudden, you begin to feel God's presence. And you realize, this feels great. And it really does. Spiritual things feel great. Great. Once you overcome the, iner the initial friction and resistance of the enemy. 
you know, getting that body moving. Some, some, I like to exercise in the morning. I like to read my Bible. I like to pray. I like to do all these things in the morning uh, because it, it gives me a trajectory. It sets me in the right direction for the day, right? Whereas if you, you know, I, I just find the day goes so much better. Amen? It really does. But sometimes if I don't, if I don't get started right off, I find that, oh, there's just this, the longer you wait, the longer you stay away from spiritual activities, the more the resistance comes because the devil's, ah, ah, ah. I see some laziness in this Christian. Oh, that's a word he loves. Oh, doesn't the devil love the word laziness? Because all he has to do is add water and stir. You have done half his work to the recipe of failure. If you and I are lazy spiritually. But you know, the amazing thing is, I'm sure, Shelly, when you're running, that there's times that you think, oh, I don't really feel like doing it today. But you make yourself do that. You may, but once you get going, like the other day, I was, I had an exercise till later on in the day, and I, oh, I'm so tired, I don't really, I, do I really, oh, I better do it. I missed yesterday, I better do it. And I exercise, anyway, now I don't think that I spend an hour and a half, I don't, I only spend 15 minutes a day. That's all I do, but I'm, I try to be consistent. But I think, you know what, I don't feel like it right now, but as soon as the blood is pumping, as soon as the activity is moving forward, this is an analogy, okay? We're going to spiritualize this. You, I, all of a sudden, that energy that you didn't think you had, you end up feeling energy, amen? And so after you're done, you think, well, I'm going to be really tired. No, you actually feel energized. In fact, they say the if you want to get to sleep at night, the last thing you should do, or the, the, the last thing, the worst thing you should do before you go to bed is exercise. Because it wakes you up. It really doesn't matter how tired you are. So you exercise long before you have to go to bed so that you're relaxed, you're relaxed when you get to bed. But exercise gives you energy. Amen? And it's true and spiritual. When we apply ourselves, discipline ourselves, and when we exercise, Bible speaks of exercising ourselves unto godliness. When you do that, you always feel good. Now, there's something that is released in the bloodstream that gives you a natural high. Does anybody know what they're called? Endorphins. I think it's some hormone, isn't it? I think it's some... Yeah, endorphins are released in your bloodstream that give you a natural high. Did you know that? And so, and, and the same thing happens when we, in the spiritual realm, that when you are applying yourself and exercising yourself on the God of this, God gives you joy. Some Christians don't experience joy because they don't apply themselves to get, you know, joy is a well. The Bible says, with joy you shall draw water from the wells of salvation. Amen? It's not something that's superficial. It's something you've got to draw out. Amen? Amen. And so uh, joy comes by doing the will of God. Amen. How many of you love Thank you, Jesus. the word of God tonight? Amen. You love this message? Amen. So endorphins are released. You know, this is interesting. Um, Brother Wallace used to be the principal of the Bible College, and he's also a registered nurse. Very, very smart. Very, 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 very smart fluently bilingual in English and French and, and just really, really bright. And he, every time you talk to him, you always learn something. And one day we were talking about hot food. How many of you like hot food? Mm -hmm. Do you like hot food? Raise your hand if you're here. Amen. You like hot food. Anybody here you don't like hot food? Like you, your idea of spice is salt and pepper. Is <laughs> <laughs> salt and pepper are great. They really are. But when I was young, I didn't care a whole lot for hot food, but I love it now. Now, of course, not, not to the point that puts me into intercessory prayer. I don't like <laughs> hot food, you know, that you're sweating and you're crying and you're, you know, and you're almost dying. But Brother Wallace told me, he said, do you know what it is that makes people like hot food? I said, no, what is it? He said, well, the Bible, the Bible, the body, <laughs> all right, an analogy here. The body actually releases endorphins, which are natural painkillers and give you a natural high because there's a little bit of pain with that hot food. Everybody say amen. amen. And so 
Uh, that's what causes people to like the hot food, is that your body actually releases endorphins as painkillers, and it gives you a natural high. So now you know that. So go home and have some salsa. <laughs> some Frank's hot, is it Frank's hot sauce? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. I found out, um, I, how many of you know brother, dear brother man, who's visiting brother man? You remember Nyla man? You remember the piano player who used to? Preach anyway. Well, he, bless his heart. He's a sweet man. I was in his house one time, and he had made this lovely chowder, and we're sitting down eating it. And he, I, I said, "What's that?" He said, "That's cayenne pepper." Mm -hmm. Cayenne pepper. I said, "Oh." He said, "Try it." He said, "It's really good." He said, "I said, well, I will." And now I have it on everything: my vegetables, my salad. I don't put it on my dessert, but I put it on practically everything else. Uh, cayenne pepper. And he said, in the countries that they use cayenne pepper, the Latino countries, you know, Mexico, South America, he said there's hardly any colon cancer. Uh, cayenne is a cleanser and also a healer. It will heal. You can put cayenne pepper on a cut. Did you know that? Yeah. yeah. Apparently it's a cleanser and it's a healer. And so I tried it and I said, wow, this is really good. It adds the zinc to the pizzazz. Yeah, it will try it. It's really, really great. I've got more people at Bible College putting cayenne pepper on their food. In fact, sometimes they don't put it back when they're done with it. And when I come through the lunch line, I say, okay, who's got the cayenne pepper? Oh, Jude had it. Jude had it. You're supposed to put it back for the next person. But I try to get everybody hooked on it because it's supposed to be so good for us. But all things spiritual require effort. Amen. Um, now, running speaks of intensity. Speaks of intensity. Amen. How many know that you've got to be intense to live for God? Right? You've got to be intense. So, well, I'm really laid back. i got a boy like that. He's laid back. He's sort of like, can't tell if he's going into the coma or coming out of the coma. <laughs> it's not Trevor, so now you know who it is. He's just there. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Eeyore. If you've watched any of it, oh well, sky might fall. Mother, I can't run away from it. Anyway, bless his heart. I'm, I'm teaching him how to drive, and it's really interesting. I've been praying for understanding, I've been praying for patience. Yeah, it's good. He's doing, he's doing great. He's a good boy, and I love him. I love him. But um, how did I get on that? Help me, somebody. Where was I right before that? I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, laid back, laid back. And it's good, I think it's good to be laid back. Because I'm kind of like the chomp it at the bit kind of guy, my natural, my nature. And so my wife is kind of more laid back. But she's busy, she's a busy kind of a laid back person. But she doesn't get her feathers ruffled very easily. I have ruffled them a few times, but I'm quite proud to say that. I, I have, I just, I just didn't seem to know how to push those buttons. But um, it's fun sometimes, it's, it's, it's sparks fly. Bringing that out is yeah. spiritual. Be spiritual. Yeah. <laughs> One time I was teaching her piano and she said, Do you treat all your students like this? And I said, No, but they don't act like you. <laughs> but she's quite laid back. And it's good to be laid back because sometimes we just need to be relaxed and rest in the Lord and patient. But the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. It allows. That word suffers in the old King James means suffers. It allows. The kingdom of God allows violence. Violence? You mean we're supposed to fight one another? Bloody nose. No. That's not what he's saying. It he's telling us that we need to be violent against the enemy. Because if you're passive, you just say, well, oh well, you know, whatever the devil wants to do to me, I just... I, I'm just so weak and I can't. No, you listen, you've got more stamina and more strength if you stir yourself up. Amen? Mm -hmm. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven allows violence and the violent take it by force. Take the kingdom of God by force? Well, why would you have to take the kingdom of God by force? Doesn't God just drop the kingdom of God, all the blessings and the benefits and spirituality? He just drops it in your lap. Oh, you wish. Don't you wish? No, the Bible says you've got to pursue. You've got to be intense. That's why it's not about running a race. That we have to, well, that's why I said take 10 minutes and pray intensely. I'd rather you all pray 10 minutes and pray intensely. Cry out to God for those souls that you know that are lost. Get a little bit emotional. You know it's all right to get emotional when you pray? Mm -hmm. Amen. It's all right to feel 
and to be intense. And that's why if you take a little bit of time and practice, amen, like you said, exercise yourself to God, it's, it's practice, right? And, and begin to get stirred up. Stir yourself, the Bible says. Stir yourself. Take hold upon the Lord. He said, those that are violent, take the kingdom by force. Amen. Now, why would there be resistance? Why would there be? Well, because the old devil, he wants to keep you sitting there in your lazy butt. He doesn't want you to be moving. He doesn't want you going after the things of God. Now, I'm going to give you a story about a man. In the Bible, he's a king. And Elisha came to him, and he had a prophetic word. I love prophetic words. They're so encouraging. And he said, take the sword and uh, the, take your bow and your arrows. And your bow and your arrows, he said. And he said, they shot the arrow and it was the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. Then he was to take that, um, the bow and the arrows, and he was to smite the ground. They didn't tell him how many times to smite the ground. But God was watching. And God said, if he hits the ground 16 times, he's going to... He's going to defeat his enemy 16 times. If he hits it once, he's going to defeat it. He's going to have one victory. Depending on the intensity of his desire. And so the king did exactly what he was told. He was very obedient, but he took no initiative. He just took it and hit the ground three times because he thought, this is kind of silly. Boom, boom, boom. And Elisha cried out to him. He said, you, you should have taken the bow and the arrows and hit the ground Several times, he said. He said, now you're only going to defeat your enemy and smite them three times. But you could have had more victory if you had been a little bit more intense. Come on. Amen. Talking about running the race. We're talking about, oh, I've run a half a kilometer. I guess that's far enough. No. You need to push yourself to the limit. That's why he uses this analogy of the race because Paul knew what it was like to push himself. Here's a man that was thrice or three times shipwrecked and beaten with rods and, and stoned, I believe, twice and left for dead one time. That's probably when he was caught up to heaven, saw the third heaven, heard some conversations that he wasn't even allowed to speak of when he came back. He was confidential. God says, you can't share this when you come back. I'm going to send you back. You're going to keep on preaching. Paul! He could have given up. He could have said, oh, this is just too hard. I can't do this. Hey, listen, those words, that vocabulary never crossed the mouth of Paul and it should never cross your mouth or mine. Amen? Amen. Amen. We don't talk defeat. We don't think defeat. We just get up and we just do it. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And you feel so great when you do, don't you? Amen. Hallelujah. I could talk a whole lot more tonight, but we're going to stand together. Because I think I've preached my point across. And one time I preached for an hour and 25 minutes. The pastor's wife, bless her heart, sat me down afterwards. The pastor was away and I, I filled in for him. And I had no idea. I, I wasn't following a, a clock that night. I was following a calendar. <laughs> and I, I, was, I had no idea. I was as long-winded as it was. And afterwards she said, you know how long you were tonight? And I said, no. She said, an hour and 25 minutes. She said, now, Brother Pearlie Hathaway told my husband, and he, Brother Pearlie Hathaway was a great preacher. Anybody know him? Yeah. She said, he said, you preach until you get your point across, then you bring it to a climax, and then you cut it off and make your appeal. And I think that's good. <laughs> that's good. I've got my point. Do you think I've got my point across tonight? Yes. Amen. I don't know how much of a climax we've come to tonight with the preaching of the word, but we're going to cut it short right there and say, all right, now go home and do something about it, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can guarantee you, you'll have joy. You'll have victory. Amen. And uh, don't listen to the voice of the enemy. Listen for the voice of God. Amen. Because God is up to great things. Now, would you like me to share with you what happened? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> so, we've been praying for our Alex, my sister's husband, Paul. We prayed for him. Remember, he had the heart condition that he lost his job because of because of his health. And it was very, very difficult for him to go through. But the Lord, the Lord has been working in his heart. He started going back to church. And anyway, um, some circumstances happened recently, and it really brought him to a breaking point. I don't have to go into the details, but 
he ended up calling the pastor. He said, I need a prayer meeting. He said, I need to pray through. I need to pray through. I need to let the Lord change it. And so they had um, booked it for last night, Tuesday night. And it's funny, I had prayed when my sister asked me to pray, but I actually at 7 o'clock when they were praying, I had kind of forgotten about the prayer meeting going on. But I was um, just doing some exercise over the college and finishing up my prayer time with the Lord. And I just felt this burden come over me to pray. And I'm just praying and I'm just talking in tongues and interceding. And I had no idea until afterwards that I realized they were having the prayer meeting for Paul to get the Holy Ghost. And so they spent about an hour or so just him forgiving and just, you know, uh, just, you know how it is or stuff. You just got to, you got to pray for yourself sometimes, right? And, and, and then I guess that was the first little bit. And then my sister told me then they, the next 20 minutes he was seeking for the Holy Ghost. And she said, within 20 minutes, he was gloriously filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And he was so excited. There's only about seven, eight, or nine, maybe, of them that had gathered, and just some friends he felt real comfortable with at the church. And then he was so happy. He said, let's go to my house, and let's have a pizza party. <laughs> so, so when I got a call from my sister, uh, she said, uh, we're having a party. You know? She said, did you hear what happened? I said, I sure did. Pastor, your pastor had sent me a picture. Of, uh, he said, this, yes, guess who just got the Holy Ghost? I said, well, that looks like a Holy Ghost smile to me. Amen. <laughs> but he prayed through. He broke through. Anyway, uh, I'm glad we didn't stop praying. We've been praying for him for decades. I've been praying for him probably for three decades. But you know what? He said, we've got a goal. We're going to reach that goal. They're going to be saved. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Pray for their son, Doug. God's working in his life. Pray that I uh, pray for our Alex. He he met with my sister, with my daughter rather, and her husband on Saturday night and went over there about seven. He left about eleven thirty. He talked and talked and talked and talked, talked about God, talked about all this stuff. You know, he's still not straightened out, but God is dealing with his heart and pray for him. I know that God's gonna restore him. I know that God's gonna fill him with the Holy Ghost. Amen. amen. Oh, he said, Well, you know, they've got a will of their own, yes they do, but Amen. I have some influence in the spiritual realm. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And I can love him, right? Amen. I can influence him in the emotional realm as well. So don't ever give up. Just keep on praying. Amen. Keep on believing God. Because God's going to have a great praying church here in this church. Amen. Let's lift the hands and love the Lord. We worship you tonight. We praise you and magnify you. God, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you, Lord, that you're doing great things in our midst. Lord, you're filling people with the Holy Ghost. You're setting people free, Lord. You're stirring up the church to pray. Hallelujah. To run the race with patience, oh God. Lord, to get that goal line, Lord. To win that crown. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless your people, Lord. Bless us with victory. Bless us with, with determination, oh God. Let us be a well-disciplined church. Hallelujah. That's, that's not passive, oh God, but but aggressive spiritually, oh Lord, that we go after the things of God. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, God, that you're going to honor us, Lord, as we pray. You're going to honor this church, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Put an anointing on us, Lord Jesus. A breakthrough anointing, oh God. A bless the services, oh God, on the weekend that's coming up. And everybody that we are witnessing to, Lord, just anoint, oh God, those words that have let them go deep into their hearts. And let them germinate, let them grow, and let great things happen, Lord, we pray. We give you praise, Lord, for all things in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Somebody say praise the Lord. God bless you. Thanks for being in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God.